Hello and welcome back to part two of my talk on taut sutured handle bodies as twisted homology products. So in part two, we will discuss certifying tautness of our sutured handle bodies, which is to say, given a taut sutured handle body that you are just told is taut, how can you tell? How can you give a certificate for this tautness? So let's begin with a recap. Um, this is our last slide from part one. Um, where we just gave the definition of what it meant for a sutured manifold to be taut. Remember also that our sutured manifold is this three manifold M uh, together with a collection of simple closed curves that separates the boundary into two, um, two subsurfaces, R plus and R minus. So our gamma is our collection of simple closed curves, which I'll also call the suture set. Um, and we have that the boundary of M is given by R plus, the union of R plus and R minus along this suture set. So we said that a sutured manifold is taught if it satisfies these three topological conditions. First of all, we want the three manifold M to be irreducible. So any, um, any embedded sphere in M actually bounds a ball in M. We also want R plus and R minus, each of our boundary subsurfaces, to actually be incompressible in M. And then finally, this third condition is really the meat of the matter. Um, so this third condition is the one that we care about the most. We want R plus and R minus to realize the Thurston norm of their joint homology class. So this is um, the Thurston norm was this measure, the complexity measure on, um, on, on our homology class where alpha is in H2 of M relative to the suture set. And this is the minimum of across representatives of our homology class of this sort of negative Euler characteristic. So it's not exactly just negative of the Euler characteristic, but it's essentially that, but ignore sort of spheres and other things with positive Euler characteristic. And this sort of key fact that we discussed in part one is that this, related, this notion of tautness relates back in a very precise way to the um, notion of a top foliation and what it means for a three manifold to admit a top foliation. So this prompted the question that we, motivates part two of our talk, how can we certify a sutured manifold as top? Let's move on to actually talking about that. Here's our question again. Um, and I wanna start by just making a very simple observation. And that observation is that if M is a product, which is to say uh, M is homeomorphic to just one of our boundary subsurfaces cross an interval. Okay, and then, you know, that's telling us that we have us in between, we have this part of our boundary that's a collection of annuli, collapse those just to simple closed curves, and that gives the suture set. If M is actually a product, M is homeomorphic to this, so R plus cross an interval, which is then, okay, homotopy equivalent to just R plus. There's no space to have a simpler representative uh, of the homology class of R plus because M itself is just hom homotopy equivalent to R plus. Um, so this is just automatically, you know, this is, this is automatically taught. There's nothing, there's nothing that can be going wrong here. Um, that doesn't get us very far because, okay, most sutured manifolds are not products. However, um, Friedel and Kim made the observation that it's enough if your sutured manifold just looks like a product from the point of view of rational homology. So that's what this statement is saying. This is saying, okay, from the point of rational homology, if we look at the induced map, by the, the, the map induced by the inclusion on the homology groups of R plus and R minus, 
into, into M, this is actually an isomorphism. That's saying that the homology of M is just captured entirely by the homology of R plus and R minus, just as it is in the case that M is a product. M is sort of entirely captured by just one of these boundary subsurfaces. That's enough to tell you that M is top. Um, so in this case, we call M a rational homology product. Okay, so, so how much further does this get us? This is more general than asking for our, for our suture manifold to be a product, but it's still not a very strong condition. And it's easy to come up with um, relatively simple examples. Here is one that is not a rational homology product, but is still top. Um, so what is this picture? This is a picture of uh, a genus two handle body. So M is homeomorphic to you genus two handle body. And I've drawn this suture set as this collection of three simple closed curves um, separating uh, the boundary of M into two pairs of pants. So R plus and R minus are both homeomorphic to pairs of pants. Now, what's going wrong in this picture? I wanna think about the induced map on H1. The, the map induced by the inclusion from one of our boundary subsurfaces. So I can think of generators for, um, for the homology of R plus or R minus as being my blue and green curves. These are just two of the holes on my pairs of pants. Now in, in homology, in the homology of R plus or R minus, these are distinct, but when I pass to the homology of M, these have the same image. These are homologous. In fact, these are, um, you know, the, well, they're, they're actually, they have the same image in pi one. And so we, we have a problem here in that, okay, we have two, um, we have two loops that are distinct in, in H1 of R plus, but map to the same thing in H1 of M. That tells us we're not a hom rational homology product, but um, this is still in fact a tot sutured manifold. Um, one thing I'll note here is um, this is an example of a genus two handle body with a suture set consisting of three curves. Um, I can show you a picture uh, of, a, of a genus two handle body with a single suture curve. So R plus and R minus are tori with a single boundary component, which is also taught but not a rational homology product. The picture is just much harder to understand and it's not as easy to see why it fails to be a rational homology product. Mm -hmm. So this tells us that rational homology isn't quite going the distance for us. So as suggested by the title of this talk, this is where this twisted homology will come into play. So what is twisted homology? The core idea is that we're going to take homology groups, a homology theory, where we're taking a little bit of extra data. We're going to take into account some choice of representation from the fundamental group of our manifold M to GLNC for some N. We're just fixing some representation. Um, and this lets us define associated to that representation these twisted homology groups, which I'll write um, as such, where my coefficients I'm denoting by this E sub alpha. Um, you can think of this as your coefficients are sort of a, a bundle, um, have a bundle structure over M and that's why we're sort of using this E sub alpha notation, um, but it's really just sort of a placeholder for, we're thinking of this representation alpha. So I don't wanna get into 
too much of the gory details of twisted homology if you haven't seen it before. Um, the key facts, well, the key fact is that every theorem about homology and cohomology still holds here. Um, I mean, not really, but every theory theorem still holds. We still have, um, you know, just some of the basic machinery we know how to work with, Foncre duality. Um, if we're a little bit careful, we have um, universal coefficient theorem. We have long exact sequence for pairs. Um, we have a notion of Euler characteristic and the relationship between um, the Euler characteristic of our manifold and um, the Euler characteristic of uh, the homology groups and so forth. Um, so in a lot of ways, this is harder to work with, but essentially the same um, underlying ideas, underlying a lot of the arguments for using twisted homology look the same as if you're working with just normal homology. Um, and in particular, one key fact that still holds here with twisted homology is that we have the same theorem from Friedel and Kim. So what is this saying? This is saying if from the point of view of our um, homology with twisted coefficients, our, um, our three manifold looks like a product, all of the homology, all of the twisted homology um, of M is captured by the twisted homology of one of our boundary subsurfaces, that's enough to tell us that M is talk. So this is just for some um, choice of representation alpha. It doesn't, it's not going to be every representation. It just needs to be one representation is enough to tell you that you're taught. Um, and in this case, we say that M is an alpha homology product to refer to um, the representation that we use to certify it. Or if we don't want to re refer to the particular representation, we'll say it's a twisted homology product. Um, so this is the, here is the example that we had before saying that M is not a rational homology product, but I claimed it was still taught. We can see that it's taught by picking an appropriate choice of representation and looking at the twisted homology. I'm not gonna go through all these computations, but suffice to say, um, any representation alpha from pi one of M to let's say GL one C. So we're not looking very far, just one dimensional representation such that if I look at the um, image of, I'm gonna use X and Y to refer to the generators of the fundamental group of this handle body. So these are just two loops around your two holes. Um, if we have that the image of the product of these is not equal to one, um, this realizes M as a twisted homology product. So we are in fact taught, what's kind of remarkable here is that we said we ran into a problem with this being a rational homology product because, um, you know, these two, the, the uh, green and blue loops, though distinct in, in H1 of um, R plus or R minus, were the same in H1 of our manifold. We had some problem with the fact that homology is abelian. Um, we're using an abelian representation. And yet somehow this is still adding enough extra data to capture this difference and to see that this is in fact taught as long as we're sort of avoiding this small bad locus of representations. All right, so this is telling us that we're, that we're getting a little bit further. Um, how much further are we getting? Okay, well, it turns out this goes the distance. 
So another theorem of Friedel and Kim says that in fact, if M is taught, then there is some representation for some choice of N that actually realizes our manifold as a twisted homology product. So remember, if M is a twisted homology product that tells us it's taught, so a, a representation giving us this twisted homology product structure serves as a certificate of tautness, this theorem is telling us that that certificate is out there somewhere. That certificate always exists. If we're taught, our manifold can be realized as a twisted homology product. But there's a catch, and that catch is that their proof uses in a very fundamental way um, Agel's virtual fibering theorem to produce this good representation, this representation realizing um, as a twisted homology product. And this is a problem because, well, the, the dimension of the representation they produce has to do with, is, is directly proportional to the degree of some cover they're taking using virtual fibering. Um, virtual fibering doesn't give you any sort of bound on the, the degree of your fibered cover. And so we're not getting any sort of at all concrete bound on what the dimension um, of this sort of fine representation is. So we get no concrete information regarding the dimension of alpha. Okay. So this is really where I am picking up the story. Um, and, and one thing I'll note is that this isn't just sort of hypothetical, you know, okay, maybe, maybe this is, you know, not a good proof, but it's really not that bad of a story. Maybe you can always just find this one dimensional representation, which works, which is easy enough to work with and find. Um, and one of the first things that I was able to sit down and say is that, well, in fact, there are examples, there are many examples which don't have any one dimensional certifying representation. Um, so this is just one such example. This is um, my, sorry, this is, this is a genus two handle body. Um, I haven't drawn the suture set. I've drawn actually um, curves that our um, generators for pi one of R plus. So R plus here is a neighborhood of my uh, red and blue curves. Um, so that will give you a pair of pants. And then taking the boundary of that is the suture set and the complement is R minus. Um, so this, it turns out, um, doing some computations with what these, you know, what the actual picture going on here, this is taught, um, but it's not a twisted homology product for any one dimensional representation. It is for, you know, any number of two dimensional representations, not all of them, but a large set of them. Um, so, so moving on from this, this poses the question, my main question that I want to be able to answer, can we give a precise description of the complexity of a certifying representation? And can we describe this, um, say in terms of, okay, we want to take into account some, some measure of complexity of the suture manifold we're working with, um, you know, okay, it would be great if we could say a two-dimensional representation always works, for instance. We know a one-dimensional one doesn't, but maybe two-dimensional always works. But can we even just say, you know, we can give a bound based on the um, number of suture components or 
in terms of the um, relatedly the Euler characteristic of R plus and minus. Or maybe we want to dive deeper and use use something um, use more machinery to be able to produce our, our certifying representations. Maybe we can somehow use something about um, a hyperbolic structure on our underlying three manifold M. Or if we obtained M by cutting cutting a closed three manifold along um, along this closed surface, as we were talking about in part one of this talk, maybe using a hyperbolic structure that we had on the original manifold. Um, and then last, I want to mention, um, maybe we can use something to do with um, our, our taught sutured manifolds have this nice sutured manifold decomposition, which um, gives a foothold towards some sort of inductive argument. And maybe we can use that to inductively build, um, inductively build a certifying representation. Um, on the other hand, what happens? Can we maybe we can get more traction if we restrict what types of representations we're looking at? So maybe instead of saying, can we just find any certifying representation? Can we find um, a nilpotent or a solvable? representation, which is to say a representation whose image is solvable. And that's where I want to key in here for the last portion of this talk um, is, is thinking about solvable representations. So our theorem here says that uh, when we restrict to solvable representations, we can see some really bad behavior. Um, we can find um, examples of taught sutured handle bodies. Um, so really, you know, handle bodies are among the simplest three manifolds of boundary you can, you can write down. Um, but even among the simple class, we can find examples which um, are not a twisted uh, homology product for any solvable representation of degree at most you know, our fixed K. Um, so what does this mean? Okay, I'm, I'm using the term degree of solvability to refer to the length of the derived series associated to um, the image of our representation. So being solvable means the derived series has finite length. I'm gonna call the length of that the degree of, the, of solvability. Um, so the idea behind this construction is Okay, well, we came up with an example which doesn't work for, which doesn't admit any abelian certifying representation. It doesn't admit uh, a representation to GL1C. This is our example from before. It doesn't admit a one dimensional certifying representation. Abelian representations are simply degree one solvable representations. Um, so we, we have this. Um, and the idea is that we're going to do an inductive construction where we take our you know, degree k minus one picture. And I need to shrink this down a little bit. And we're just going to double it and tube these together in some clever way to build a new sutured manifold where we're sort of building a new suture set using the old ones that are sort of creating, um, creating something that is an obstruction that's sort of one degree deeper in the derived series. This is a really a cartoon of the argument. Um, a corollary of this is that for all n, GLNC is uh, is is 
um, doesn't admit subgroups, solvable subgroups of degree, you know, some, some bound of solvability. This means that we can immediately promote this previous theorem to saying for all n, we can find a taut sutured Hamel body which doesn't admit any solvable certifying representation to GLNC for that fixed n. And really, so so in summary here, we focus. We've said that you know we can't we can't restrict to solvable representations and still have this this theory work. We can still have arbitrarily bad behavior. We're not going to get a sort of neat bound on the complexity of the, the representations we need. Um, and why is this even perhaps remotely um, of interest in the construction that in the argument that Friedel and Kim give producing their certifying representation um, in the case that, we're, that the manifold at hand is a handle body their construction actually gives a solvable representation. So this is saying their argument as is, is not gonna be able to sort of be promoted to, to actually give something nice for all manifolds because for handle bodies, it's already sort of poorly behaved. All right, I will stop there. Thank you for your time and your attention. Um, thank you.